on tonight, and I'm excited to talk to all of you individually as well, but um, I see many familiar faces, uh, some friends that I've known my whole life um, since birth, and some new friends that I'm meeting just tonight, and it's always fun for me to come back to New York. I lived here for two years right after college, like many people, I came and went, um, but it has stayed as my second home uh, pretty much since then, and it's always fun to come back. Unfortunately, I can no longer get my rent stabilized for a walk up in the West Village, um, but uh, I'm always happy to come back, and I'm so thrilled that you're here tonight and for the support that you have given to me in this campaign and the excitement for a race from across the country. And um, it is an exciting race, so I'll tell you all a little bit more about it, and then I'm happy to answer questions, because there may be things that you are more or less interested in, and I'm well-versed now in many topics. But, um, but a little bit of background, people always want to know, who are you, what are you doing, and why are you doing it? Scott's covered most of it. I'm Lizzie Fletcher, I'm married to Scott, um, and I'm a lifelong Houstonian, other than my two years in New York, college and law school. Um, I'm a practicing lawyer, I've been practicing for about 12 years, and I do business litigation. I work at a litigation boutique um, and I, where I am a, a partner and try cases, um, commercial cases pretty much. But it's given me the opportunity to represent people from across my community. Um, I've represented refinery inspectors and I've represented CEOs and everybody in between in all kinds of industries, all kinds of matters. And it's given me a great perspective on my community um, that I you know, continue to get to know, especially as a candidate. But after the 2016 election, um, Scott and I started talking a lot about what was happening in the world and our concerns about the direction we seemed to be going, um, that we felt that Donald Trump really didn't represent our district. He didn't win our district, but uh, neither did my congressman, John Culberson. And he has been in Congress now for nine terms. He's done very little for our community. Um, in fact, most people don't know much about him, but a lot of the people who do don't like him because he hasn't done very much um, to help our community, he hasn't represented our values in Washington. And we just put our first ad up of the general election and talk about really the drivers of the campaign, which is, I am from Houston. I don't know how many people here have been to Houston. Um, I see a few hands. Okay, great. So, um, so Houston isn't the most beautiful city um, in the country. Uh, not, we're not fighting for that um, distinction, but it is, I think, one of the best places to live, and it's a great place to live because of the people and the community. Because it's hot and humid and has blind cockroaches, <laughs> if you want to live in Houston, we want you there. <laughs> we're happy if you want to be part of the community and work with us. And it really is a hardworking community. It's people who come together from all walks of life, all backgrounds. Uh, it has an, a large immigrant community. It's one of the largest refugee resettlement um, areas in the country. And uh, we're just excited that people want to be there and be part of our community. And it's a very welcoming place. It's a hardworking place. It's an innovative place. I always talk about, you know, we have NASA and everybody knows, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Um, but uh, what, what we also know is that when we have the problem, when the Apollo mission, that the, the people in Houston figured out how to solve that problem with duct tape. And we don't let problems get in our way. We see them as opportunities. And all of those qualities that we think of as sort of Houston values and Houston qualities, we're not seeing a lot of those in Washington. Um, we are seeing entrenched partisanship. We are seeing people who will not work to solve problems. We've been talking to a lot of voters to say, you know, if I wouldn't talk to the people that are in my office every day that I'm expected to work with, I would get fired. And I think that that's what we need right now. I think we need a whole lot of people not to get fired. I'm working on my one congressional district, but I'm very optimistic that it's going to happen across the country because there are a lot of people who aren't doing what they're sent to Washington to do and what they're supposed to be doing. And John Culberson is Exhibit A. So I talked to a lot of people about a year and a half ago and became convinced that this was something that I could do. Um, I, I Originally, I just thought, oh, well, I, I represent people for a living. I'm a lawyer, you know, how hard could it be? Um, what I've come to realize over the year and a half that I've been doing this is that it really does take a set of skills that we use as lawyers all the time, you know, where you, you negotiate and you find compromise and you agree on things where you can find agreement and you fight over the things you need to fight over and you've got to be able to learn the difference and you've got to be able to work with people and build relationships and disagree and not destroy the whole system in the process. And for many of us, I think we fear that the system is being destroyed. Um, and I think 
think that there's an opportunity to take it back and to turn things around, but we need to send people who are willing to do the work. And so I decided to get into this race, and as Scott said, um, it was a crowded primary. Um, it was exciting to be a part of that, and because we have so many qualified, excellent candidates, we increased Democratic voter turnout in our primary by 500 percent so we have a lot of excited Democrats. Um, we have been lucky to have several folks that, who have you know, this national significance coming through, and that's really mobilized and energized a lot of the voters and volunteers, especially in our community. So Port of Booker was in last weekend rallying our troops um, right after the right after the Kavanaugh hearings. He was down in Houston and gave a really, really moving speech and got our 100 people who were there to knock on doors in 100 degree weather, you know, excited to go out. Um, and that's what we're seeing in Houston. And so that's one of the things you may, you may wonder. Um, I know there have been times when we felt sort of hopeless in Houston that we didn't have races to work on, and so we had a lot of people who were investing in and watching races around the country. Um, and I think in Texas, we're so excited to have so many competitive races this year that there is just this incredible momentum and excitement on the ground. Our race is incredibly competitive. All of the major ratings agencies have rated it as a toss-up, um, whether it's Cook Political Report, CNN, Crystal Ball. Nate Silver has us at 50-50, but we're just a little bit ahead. Um, and Nate Silver's, uh, the recent polling, we are just within the margin of error. Um, so it really is a toss-up, and it's up to us to convert all of that and make sure that we come out ahead. It's going to be a close race either way. Um, the historically Republican district has never been in front of um, because when it was redistricted and created in the 60s, the first person in the was George W. Bush. Um, a lot of the Republicans in our districts don't think that he is the Republican party. Um, he will be my um, and that's kind of the community that we come from. It's, it's fiscally conservative and traditionally Republican, but very socially progressive. Houston is the biggest city in the country that elected the first openly lesbian mayor. Um, and, you know, she told people she was term limited out of, of being there. Um, I think that it is a very, um, very progressive community on a lot of fronts. And one of the things that's been an issue in the race that um, kind of came to this in part from a long long experience of being a Planned Parenthood volunteer um, and have realized there's a, a crowd of people in our Venn diagram a lot of people in the Planned Parenthood. There are a whole lot of women in our community and men um, who are supportive of Planned Parenthood and they're traditionally fiscally conservative but they are they are right there on this issue and they see that now more than ever those rights are under attack. The effort to defund Planned Parenthood, which is really the same word, but the attacks on Planned Parenthood um, have mobilized a lot of people. And for those of you who remember, there were the sting videos of Planned Parenthood a couple of years ago, so Harris County, where we live, um, someone referred that case to the to a grand jury to consider indicting Planned Parenthood, and they wound up indicting the people who made the video. <laughs> so that's the that's the community you know that I'm coming out of, and I think we're just looking for somebody who's really going to represent us. Somebody who's not beholden to special interests, somebody who's not beholden to the national party. And what you see with my opponent is that he votes with the party 98% of the time. He votes with Trump more than any other member of the Texas delegation, which is pretty surprising when you think about the fact that Trump lost his district. Um, but he is just a hardline and rank and file vote. He's in the Tea Party caucus. Um, he doesn't believe that the federal government should really do anything. And he's shown that in 18 years, he's done very little. So for us, it's a real opportunity to send somebody to Congress who cares about us, who's going to prioritize our needs, who's a member of the community and takes part in it. And that's, that's I think, why we've got so much enthusiasm and excitement. Um, and it's, it's a really exciting place to be as a candidate. I've gotten a lot of attention. I know you all, all probably got the, the article in the Atlantic um, or the New York Times when they came down. Um, so, you know, it's very cool to do it, but the truth is, I'm really just the vessel for all of the people in my district who are working so hard, who are so motivated, um, and it's a real privilege to be seen here, to be the person who can tell about it, and to be sharing those hopes and aspirations that we can do better. Um, and I'm very confident that we've got an incredible team put together that will make it happen. So, I thank you all for being part of that. Being here tonight, and your support, I'm happy to answer questions on anything.
really. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. What's the um, voter registration rate now? So we don't register by parking technically, but you can. We've done our research, and um, there are a couple of indicators. If you look at the primary elections, the Democrats outvoted the, the Republican. I mean, the Republicans outvoted the Democrats. There were 38,000 Republican voters and 33,000 Democrats. It doesn't really correlate perfectly to the November elections. Um, when we've done our research and polling, basically about a third of people consider themselves Democrat. Um, Republicans. I don't like getting this backwards. Um, about a third say they're Republicans. About 27, 28 percent say they're Democrats, and everybody else says they're independent. It tends to lean Republican. Um, so overall, it's historically voted Republican. The Hillary vote was a great exception, um, and I think in some of the municipal races and the school board races, there's a big school board district within this district, and they've elected a Democratic school board member in the last year or so. What we really have are a lot of thoughtful voters. You see a lot of the numbers are different for every single race. We have people who are really picking the candidates um, and like to see themselves as independent. So we're counting on them. In our last poll, I was leading with independents by 20 points, um, leading with women who make up 55% of the voters in the district. So it's some of those key demographic areas where we need to communicate with people this campaign's ahead. We're losing to Houston and changing our registration. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there are a lot of ways you can help. Thank you, thank you for asking. Um, just giving money is always helpful because it fuels everything we do. And I didn't know that because I really hadn't been an active campaign volunteer before either for a variety of reasons. You know, trying to make partner in a law firm and the fact that we didn't have a lot of competitive races. Um, but that is a huge help. So I thank you all for that. Um, we have remote phone banking for anybody who wants to call a couple of times. Um, Christopher is here and he's been a volunteer for us remotely doing research and some other things. Um, some donor research, but hopefully some other stuff too. Um, issue research, Bob has helped me with a lot of papers. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can do, but the kind of easy volunteer stuff you can plug right into is phone calls that you can do remotely. Everybody's welcome to come down. Um, I have several college friends coming down to knock on doors and get out the vote. Um, and we have a lot of opportunities you know, for that room. It's been a weekend or a week. Um, and uh, we write postcards, that's another thing. Um, it's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, on your own, you know, or with some friends and a bottle of wine, um, just encouraging people to come out. So um, those are kind of the three key key field things um, that we need. That's great. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, when you, um, I'm convinced. <laughs> uh, when you were describing who's ready to do what, you mentioned neighborhoods I'm assuming might not be part of your, your district, but I'm very interested in talking from the people. Uh, one is climate change, mm -hmm. obviously it's disputed still with what you mentioned. And the other is you said you have large enclaves and communities. Mm -hmm. uh, people who weren't born and not in the field, maybe not for the long term. So what do you say and what do people care about in those facilities? Uh, so I might take those in reverse order. Um, on the immigrant question, Houston really is a city of immigrants, and for those who grew up there, like me, it seems to be really we were growing up. Um, my mom grew up there. Her house used to be the end of the earth. You drive an hour from her house. If she still lives in it, you're still in Houston. Um, we do have, um, I think it is, it is officially the most diverse city in the country, believe it or not. I think Sugar Ring, which is kind of a suburb, is really the most, but you know, we celebrate that diversity and we're excited about it. And I think immigration is a big issue because there's so many people in our community who come on work visas, some people who come who are undocumented, um, and some people who are just stuck in the process. You know, a lot of family, um, family members that are trying to get here. So on those issues, I, I think that it's, it's pretty clear that we need a comprehensive immigration reform bill. And I think it's a great example of where the House of Representatives is really failing us because the Senate passed bipartisan legislation at a large margin five years ago, and the House won't even take it up. The Freedom Caucus is stalling in and making sure that you know, it won't get a vote and it can't be heard, and it's really affecting people's lives. And people in our community are also living in fear. You know, I know a young woman um, who is married to a dreamer, and her father is undocumented. She goes to work every day and comes home worried that somebody's not going to be here. And it is a real fear that people feel threatened to be. And so that's something that we have to prioritize. 
Um, certainly, it's a complicated question. That's why the Senate bill was a compromise, and it's been attacked for more demo, right? But for a lot of imperfections. But you know, we're failing everyone if we don't try to do something. And it's probably not going to be perfect, and there are probably going to be future things that we need to do. But I've talked to a lot of immigration lawyers about quick fixes and things we can do. Um, but I think that, that that is a priority in our community. And then you know, the other thing, people do talk about environmental issues. And um, I, I think it's a false choice to say that we have to choose in our community between our economy and our environment. And you find that there are people who are involved in the oil and gas business. This is the home of the oil and gas business. The energy corridor is in this district. And it's the home to most of the major oil and gas companies and the service providers. Um, so that is a big part of our community, but we believe in global warming. Now our rep doesn't. Um, our John Culberson denies climate change. He says the science is still out there. In fact, he bought some fossils um, to try to figure it out. Um, so there's more to read on that, but with his campaign funds. So somebody filed a complaint about that recently, and the answer was he bought the fossils because he wanted to study climate change. It's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> So, um, and you know, a lot of people responded and said, look, if you wanted to learn about climate change, come talk to the people who are your constituents, because we have scientists at Rice. We have scientists that all these oil companies are, they're way ahead of him, and they're ahead, frankly, of a lot of people in the government, because I think what these energy companies want especially is predictability and stability, and they want to know what the rules are so they can play within the rules. And they're projecting and planning 30 and 40 years out. And so the instability that we're seeing in this administration um, is really a problem. And many of them, like I said, are way off the head of the government um, on some of that stuff. And you know, they, they want clean air and clean water, and they care about the environment. Um, and so I think that we need to figure out ways that we can talk about it without making it an either or choice. And what I talk about a lot on the campaign trail, too, is that we want Houston to stay the energy capital of the world. And if you look at what we're doing globally, the world is moving on. And you know, there will be a demand for alternative sources of energy. Texas has a huge wind energy um, industry. And of course, we're also interested in solar, although the battery and things are you know, getting developed elsewhere. But I think we should be developing that stuff. And I think we should be coming up with incentives and ways in our community to make sure that we stay not just the oil and gas capital, but the energy capital. And I think that that's good for our economy, and it's good for jobs, and it's good for our planet. And I found that on the campaign trail, that's what the voters felt the should be with. So that's, that's how I talk about it, and I think that's where the community really is. But there are a few deniers everywhere, but I mean, I think that's, and, and certainly the other piece I would just add to that is we see the effects of it. And we just had the anniversary of Hurricane Harvey, and all the scientists agree that we are having increased frequency and intensity of the rains in our area because of climate change because we're so close to the ocean, it's at warmer temperatures, it's warmer than the air, we're having additional rain, and these rain events are penalizing for our community. So we need to address that so that we can live with what we have and not find ourselves out of our homes like so many of our neighbors. So I'm going to come. Yeah. So, one short question, one slightly longer one. First, would you support the Senate compromise bill on immigration? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's a really good place to start. It's not perfect. Um, I know it's so, clearly not perfect, yeah. but it's something. But yeah, I think, and then that's what I heard from a lot of immigration experts, yeah. a lot of immigration lawyers in our community say it really gets at both so, you know the border security issues, but it gets at the visas and it gets at um, a lot of things. So I think that that's a good place to start. Thank you. Should the Democrats and the majority have a lot of national pressure to address it? Well, my view generally is I do think we need to have a check on the Trump administration, and I think that's a major reason why we need to take back the House. And that's a big part of why I'm here, because as we watched the transition and the beginning of this Congress, this Congress is just going along with whatever the Trump administration is doing. There are a whole lot of things that we're not seeing, and there are a whole lot more things that they won't let Democrats perform any oversight on because they're in the minority. You know, whether it's not responding to letters that are coming in because you don't have to respond to things for a ranking member. Um, that kind of thing, I think, has got to change. So I do think that we need transparency, we need accountability, and we need to hold the Trump administration accountable. That said, on the big question, probably the impeachment. 
assessment question. Um, I don't know the answer to that yet. I'm, I'm a process person, I'm a lawyer, I want to get through the Mueller investigation and see where we are. Certainly, I'm very concerned about the things that I'm reading in the paper. Um, I am no fan of Donald Trump. That's why I'm here. Um, you know, why we're all here. Yeah, that's why we're all here. So, um, but I think that we need to look at that when it's finished um, and then be prepared to act. And I think the House needs to be prepared to act. But, you know, with the, the trial will be in the Senate. Um, and so we need to think carefully about sort of what we're going to want to do for the next couple of years. But we've got to have a check on this administration. Um, and I think that taking back the House gives us the ability to be the, the um, heading the committees, doing the investigation. And I do think there are investigations that, that we need to start um, and things that we need to look at. And I think the Democrats will do that, but I'm very confident that we will focus our energies at the same time on addressing the things that the voters are talking about. Because the biggest restriction, I think, a part of what went into voting for Trump is that people feel like there are a whole lot of people in Washington who aren't doing anything for they're not addressing health care, they're not addressing immigration, the wages are stagnant, and people want to see something working for them. And so I think if the Democrats go up to Washington and all we do is talk about what's wrong with the Trump administration, we're going to be in a lot of trouble in 2020. There's a lot more heat and light on women's rights. How are you talking to the hostiles? Um, well, there's some hostiles that don't talk to me, um, but I've been pretty out there. I mean, my first ad in the, <coughs> the primary was put up on broadcast TV, and it was me standing in front of Planned Parenthood talking about how I started volunteering there in 1992 during the Republican National Convention. Um, I, like I said, I think that there is a contingent in our district of voters who are kind of Planned Parenthood Republicans, Planned Parenthood supporters. The, the local Planned Parenthood affiliate in our community is very strong and has widespread bipartisan support and has worked hard to make sure that it stays bipartisan. Um, there's a woman who's a Republican member of the Planned Parenthood Texas Votes Board who's been supporting me even in the primary, <laughs> even though she's a Republican. Um, there are a lot of people that actually, one of the state house districts within this congressional district has the only pro-choice Republican in the Texas legislature elected, and she is consistently reelected because the people in our community want to reward her for taking that position. Um, as I mentioned earlier, George H. W. Bush was the, the first occupant of the seat, and he's actually the person who is a member of Congress to introduce Title X family planning funding. So I like to say a Title X was born in Texas Seven, and that those are the values of the community, and that's what we're not seeing. John Culberson signed on to the the letter to HHS to defund Planned Parenthood, and look, we have seen in Texas how that works. The state of Texas tried to remove. Planned Parenthood from the family planning program and struggled for many years, but kind of finally figured out how to do it over the objections of the federal government. And what we've seen is that maternal mortality in Texas has skyrocketed. The Texas has the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world. And it disproportionately affects women of color. And the state is unwilling to study why that's happening, but we know that the lack of access to family planning facilities and the lack of access to care is a huge factor. And that's why so much goes back to healthcare when we're talking to voters, um, because people are worried about access to care, affordability, they're worried about prescription drugs, but for so many women, they're worried about access to their provider of choice and to their annual exam, which for many of them is the only time they see a doctor all year. So I've been pretty out front on that. I think that there's some people who will not vote for me for that reason, but I don't think it's the majority of voters in our district. And frankly, I think it's too important for for women, I think, and, and for families, your economic, your emotional, and your overall well-being is absolutely tied to your ability to, to plan your, your family and to you know, control your destiny. And I think that um, that is a, that's a basic equality issue. So I haven't run into too many. I mean, there are people on my Facebook page who said I'm going to hell. They, um, right? I mean, but they haven't. I haven't seen them that much in, in person. <laughs> and they may all be Russian bots. I mean, but, but but yeah, I mean, we put that video up and the ad out, and you know, I get a lot of hate mail, and there'll be more. Um, I heard Nancy Pelosi say once, like, this is not for the faint of heart, and it's not. You know, you put yourself out there, and people love to criticize, and you know, I'm not perfect. There's plenty to criticize, but at the end of the day, I think what we want are people who go to Washington who are trying to do the right thing, 
and who are committed to representing the people that sent them there. We don't have that in our district, and I think we're ready for it. Yes? I'm among the people who is aghast at the Republican Party's failure to repudiate its own lunatics. <laughs> uh, but I'm an equal opportunity political critic. And I'm similarly aghast at the Democratic Party's failure to repudiate its lunatics. Uh, there is a wave of candidates coming into the ranks whose principal distinction seems to be their willingness to loudly proclaim their own ignorance on matters ranging from healthcare policy to international relations. What is the role of incoming elected representatives in saving their own party from itself? Well, I think that you know, as an aspiring incoming freshman, um, you know, there is a challenge and there's a learning curve of figuring things out. And I, I'm probably in that group of people that profess a little bit of ignorance on the front end, which is a general ignorance that I would say I'm not the expert on anything. I'm not a health policy expert. I mean, I've volunteered at Planned Parenthood for 25 years, and so I know a lot of statistics, and I know how important it is. But there are other areas where I'm really not. I'm not a flood mitigation expert. Right. Now, acknowledging ignorance is great. Right. Pretending otherwise is the problem. Right. But I think I think that um, you know the job is to partner with experts, to work with people, and I think it's true in in on Capitol Hill as well. There are people who know how it works. There are people who've been there a long time um, who are able to kind of advise on policy matters. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I think that what you're seeing with this crop of of candidates is a real desire to actually affect change and to, to move things forward. And so far, I've been very lucky to meet a lot of members of the party who share that view. I've been endorsed by the New Democrat Coalition, um, working pretty closely with them, which I think is a perfect tie for our, our district. And I think that so many of us who are new at this are really taking this attitude that we're, we're supposed to be there to represent the people who send us. And I think that's a huge part of the breakdown right now in both parties. Because when you have these safe seats as a result of gerrymandering, people don't have to campaign. I've seen John Culberson in Houston more in the last month than I've seen him in 18 years as my rep. And I think if all of these races were competitive and people needed to worry about being more accountable to their own voters and to their communities than to leadership, I think you would see things very really differently. And so that's the hope. Just to follow up briefly, can you elaborate on how you can see that the distinction between representation and leadership is the job to represent your constituents or is the, the job to lead your constituents in a representative way? I think it has to be both. You, know, you have to represent the voice of your constituents. And um, even if you you know maybe personally disagree, there are times where you, it's clear where your district is. You know, someone asked me, um, the other day a question about offshore drilling. And I said, well, in my district, my district supports offshore drilling, right, that we do that. You can say it's a state's issue, you can do it different places, but that is where my district is. Um, but I do think that people in district are just going to work every day, and they're not following the intricacies of what's happening on Capitol Hill. And many of us are, are policy experts, so we're looking to our representative to gather the information that we need to make those decisions and then to inform people, here's why I'm doing this, here's why I think this is the right thing to do, but you have to be receptive if people say, that's not where we are, to figure out how to marry those things. And certainly, you know, our history is full of examples of leadership and courage and doing the right thing even when it's not popular. And I think that that's what we need out of the people we elect. I think we need both of those things. And I think we'll be in a much better place if we can get it. Yes? So there's, a, there's obviously a huge divide between the Republicans Democrats. There's also a, a, a divide within the Democratic Party. Um, some of it came out of the last uh, presidential primary system. Bernie Wing, we can simplify it, with Bernie Wing and the Hillary Wing on those um, How do you see bridging that divide? Yeah, so Scott alluded to this in, in the opening um, statement that we went through that a little bit in our district in our primary and I think that one of the great things that came out of that is that everyone in my district feels like there's a whole lot more that unites us than divides us um, for as uh, difficult um, and heated as that primary got uh, everybody's on the same page about what it is that our priorities really are and I think that 
know, dissension is good. I, I, I prefer the Democratic approach where you can have different views than the Republican approach where if you're not opposed to abortion and if you are not, you know, passing this limit step, you can't run in the primary and you can't win. I think the Democratic model is much better, uh, but I think it's going to take good leadership. I think it's going to take people um, in the caucus who are able to bring everybody together and kind of corral all those disparate voices to actually work and get things done. Um, and, I, and I think it's possible. Um, and like I said, I think it's much better than the Republican approach where they're basically, you have to be one way. And I know, I've heard people in my district say they would love to challenge Paul person as a Republican, but they don't think they can win the primary. Um, so I think that it's, it's a really interesting time. But what we found, our primary was pretty brutal. And everybody came together at the end, all seven, uh, candidates, there were six other people on the ballot and one who didn't get on the ballot, so the seven other candidates in my race all did a fundraiser in August, and they all put their names on the invitation, invited people, raised money, and um, participated because they know what our ultimate goal is, and I think that that is very telling. I think the Democrats see what's at stake right now. Um, I think it's good to have a diversity of voices, but I think we can't allow it to keep us from functioning. So I think good leadership at the top will help with that, too. I don't want to keep you guys captive forever. I'm happy to stay and keep talking longer. Um, but I thank you all so much for being here. I thank you for your support. Um, it's really fun to see you. It's really fun to meet some new people, to see old friends. Um, and I'm so grateful for all of you for coming, for being a part of this campaign. I'm excited to come back as the next member of Congress from the 7th Congressional <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.